Well, hello and welcome. My name is Mark Eppner. I'm a Chicago-based pilot with over half of my 2,000 plus hours in a Cirrus SR22. Currently, I fly this 2011 normally aspirated G3, but also fly other aircraft when the opportunity presents itself. I love flying every bit as much as you do and look for ways to share that common bond through multiple paths, including this channel, as well as Simple Flight Radio, which you can find at simpleflight.net. My goal for the channel is to share my passion for aviation with others that share that same sentiment and do so with an eye towards proficiency, safety, and fun. Well, hello and welcome. Those of you that know me have been hearing me talk a lot about situational awareness lately. And the reason is because I started to notice differences between me and others I'd fly with in terms of applying situational awareness in the cockpit. These were intelligent, skilled, and experienced pilots, but for some reason, they weren't seeing what I was seeing or, or vice versa. And maybe it's because maybe I was in the right or the back seat, and as they are in the left seat, they're kind of burdened with that aviate, navigate, communicate, so my mind could open up a little bit more. But I even saw it when I was flying left seat. And so what I decided is it might be because I have a broader view of what I should be paying attention to. And without taking you down my 60-minute presentation on the subject, I wanted to try a little experiment with you today. So foundationally, we all know situational awareness is perceiving changes in a dynamic environment, understanding the implications of those changes, and being able to project that into the future. Simple enough, but when you put it into a busy, complex airspace, maybe like Chicago or many other areas, and you add to that moving aircraft, high speeds, towers, obstacles, terrains, airspace, all of those things that can add a level of complexity to the environment makes the difficulty level go up. So because of all that, many accept that a situational awareness skill is really something that must be learned, but yet can't be taught because it must be experienced. And I think there's some truth to it. And we see that, you know, primary students, for instance, start with a very forward view of the world, focusing just in front of the airplane and as well as the horizon or maybe in the cockpit. And as they become more experienced, there is an expanding view of the world around them. But it seems to stop as it grows forward and to the side to eventually a wings forward view. Most of us know that it's important to get to a 360 view from the cockpit, kind of put us in a bubble, if you will. But not only our bubble, but we need to be able to leverage our empathy gene to move those bubbles around not only other aircraft in our sector or our airspace, but around obstacles, terrain, airspace, airports, weather systems. All of those things interact with us, and you need to be able to put yourself in the shoes, if you will, of each of those to know what's happening over time and how it will affect my flight. So let's get on with it. For today's little experiment, I grabbed some audio clips from a flight in which I was sitting in the right seat. We were VFR on a sleepy Sunday in the Chicagoland area, and what I heard on the radio made me do a prediction that the pilot in command didn't necessarily pick up or agree with. And I wanted to use that as an example of what we can do if we do expand our view of what SA, situational awareness, is. Now, there's a little glitch in the liveatc.net feed in that you can't hear any of the cockpit conversation. So all you will hear is ATC to the airplanes. Here's the setup. We're heading to Chicago Executive, Papa Whiskey Kilo, just about eight miles north of O'Hare from the west southwest. The pilot in command, we were VFR, but decided wanted a shooter approach, so contacted Chicago Approach and asked for that approach, which we were given. So listen to the following ATC communications, and then I'm going to follow up with some questions which you should be able to answer based on the information given in these ATC recordings. So let's give it a try. 3 3 Delta, turn right direct to Phil's, join the final. 3 3 Delta, descend and maintain 2,500. Yeah, we all got stepped on there. Number 237, Sierra Tango, maintain 3,000, direct away fam. November 3, Sierra Delta, you're four miles from Phil's, cross Phil's at three, uh, I'm sorry, cross Phil's at above 2,500, clear down and roll one six approach. 3, Sierra Delta, your best forward speed all the way to Pammy. All right, so we have that. Now our goal should be to build a mental map of what is going on around us. So let's see if we're on the same wavelength. 
My first question, how many airplanes are in the picture at this point? Easy enough, right? There are two. We heard ATC talk to us and one other airplane. We're not on tower, so there could be other aircraft in the pattern because it is VFR, but at least we know on our frequency in our sector, there's two airplanes. Where are we going? Chicago Executive, we know that. Where is the other aircraft going? Well, they're going to Chicago Executive too, same frequency, same sector, and they were cleared to OIFAM, which is an initial approach fix on the east side of the RNAV GPS T approach, if you will. Uh, so we know they're going to the same place. Okay, who's first and who's second? Well, we heard that I was cleared. And when I say I, again, I'm not flying, but I'm in the airplane. So our airplane, 973 Sierra Delta, was cleared for the approach and the other airplane was not. So we're first. What kind of planes are involved? You know, I'm flying an SR-22. Now, interesting, and it's not really that relevant to the scenario, but... We have a Generation 3, a 2011, which has a bit of a difference between the more current Generation 5 and 6. And something that we're going to talk about in a second is something ATC is not aware of, but creates stress and makes me up my game a little bit when working with Chicago Approach going into Chicago Executive Airport. But wait on that. We'll be there in a second. So in terms of the other aircraft... If you're not familiar with Chicago, this may be a little bit of a tougher assignment, but very rarely, especially in the winter, but year round, will you see aircraft coming in from over Lake Michigan that are single engine piston and coming into OIFAM, they're over Lake Michigan. So one, knowing that Chicago executive is one of the busiest executive airports, actually one of the busiest airports in Illinois behind uh, O'Hare and Midway. That kind of adds to the evidence. And then when I hear a plane's coming in from over Lake Michigan, I assume it's either a piston twin or a turbine, whether it be a prop jet or a business jet. And probably 90 plus percent of the time, you'd be right. But the other thing we heard is we were told to keep best forward speed. So that says to me, we're slower than the other aircraft because ATC is all about keeping separation. And if they don't give me an instruction, best forward speed or 150 knots to the final approach fix, then I know everything's fine. When they tell me best forward speed, they're mapping it out and they need me to keep my speed up so that they don't have to make any further adjustments. So we know the other aircraft is faster, which goes back to the idea of a piston twin or potentially a, um, a turbine engine airplane. This, by the way, turned out to be a Meridian. The other thing that I was hinting at before, I have a Generation 3 airplane. Our top flap speed is 119, 119 knots. Usually they ask us when we're being sequenced in this kind of situation to maybe be as fast as 150 knots. Well, the newer Generation Cirrus, you can drop flaps at 150, not with mine. So again, it's ATC doesn't think about this. I wish they did. Certainly I could say unable, but if there's a long line, I don't want to go to the back of the line. So what I do as a strategy is I go faster than the 150 knots, increase the separation, but then start my slowdown earlier so that they can adjust on the back end. And when I hit the final approach fix, I want to be at 120 knots and start down toward um, the final approach segment. It works, and again, one of those things that is part of situational awareness. Okay, so now a transmission that I don't have but came next was the Meridian said something to the effect of Chicago Approach, we need a delay, we're diagnosing a fuel sending unit or a fuel indication issue, something like that. No panic, hey, we just need a little bit of time up here. It was at that point my spidey sense, or is what some others might call my alert level, jumped one level. Something changed, right? We had this all planned out. We're synchronized, choreographed. Everything's going perfect. And now we hear something different. So it may have been totally benign, but it makes me think, okay, something changed. Does this impact what we're doing? And what I saw in my mind was that we have a quiet Sunday, nothing going on, the guy's no stress. And we hear minor issue and fuel. Minor and fuel issue shouldn't go in a sentence together. So I turned to my PIC and I said, looks like we're going to get our approach clearance canceled and we're going to get a 180 degree turn out of here. He wasn't there at all. 
And I thought, well, why would ATC leave someone out there? Or why would a pilot dealing with an issue not want to get on the ground? Again, it's kind of a quiet day. Why not mitigate a risk? And sure enough, this is the next transmission that came across. Seven Sir Tango, you know what? I'm going to declare an emergency for you. Uh, say again, uh, nature of emergency and uh, souls and fuel on board. Seven Sir Tango, Roger, and I uh, understand you want to go direct to the field. Seven Sir Tango, turn left direct to the field. The set to maintain 2,500. Three Sir Delta, cancel approach clearance. We've got to make room for this emer uh, emergency coming in. Maintain uh, 2,500 and turn right, right turn heading 270. So I think the reason that this all percolated in my head was a pilot recently told me that the two most important things a pilot thinks about is the next two things. It's all about being situationally aware and staying ahead of the airplane. And the outcome of that is it results in planned and proactive decisions and much safer outcomes. So by expanding our view, by bringing in all of these other data points to help us paint a picture, I think improves our situational awareness. I think it allows all of us to take our SA game to the next level. We just need to be aware of the gaps. And that's my intent today, to see if, if you agree with me that there is a gap and that we can do better in terms of expanding the number of factors we include as we build our map and our visualization of what's going on in the world around us. So that was the purpose of today's little experiment. I'm interested. Do you agree? Do you find this exercise of value? Should I do more? Really interested to hear your thoughts. And until the next time, blue skies and tailwinds.